Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons over on Patreon have voted for me to discuss how Mississippi became a state. If you'd like to vote for statehood discussions or animated battle maps, please join the Patreon page for as little as one dollar. I appreciate all the support and your contribution helps me purchase books and do research for the channel. The development of Mississippi as a state begins around the year 1699 with a fort in what is now the state of Mississippi at Ocean Springs. The French established that fort and then 17 years later, in 1716, established Fort Rosalie, the modern day city of Natchez. French and English traders utilized Natchez along the Mississippi River for the fur trade, especially whitetail deer hides. The Choctaw and Chickasaw also brought in hides for sale to European merchants along the Mississippi River. Because the Native American groups outnumbered the French and English, they held the upper hand in negotiations about trade and land use. The French and Indian War, or the Seven Years War, brought about a lot of change for the area known as Mississippi. It would now be under British control. However, British control had little impact on the economic system for some time. The early governors appointed to oversee West Florida proved to be a sorry lot and rarely left Pensacola or Mobile. The home government removed the first British governor for incompetence, and his replacement found the lieutenant governor, Montfort Brown, who had served as interim governor, charged with embezzlement before the new governor committed suicide. Not until 1770 did the British find a competent governor, Peter Chester. With the French pulling out and many of the Native Americans leaving Natchez, that area was somewhat abandoned. The governor of West Florida got reports of the fertile lands and untold agricultural potential in the area and decided it needed to be settled with English subjects, so he gave hefty land grants to the veterans of the French and Indian War. However, it was difficult to get many people to move out into this isolated area. Anthony Hutchins proved to be an outlier. He, along with the help of a Natchez Indian guide named Tom, they found an abandoned village near St. Catherine's Creek. With the help of some apprentices, Anthony cleared off the land and built some log cabins for his family. He then returned to South Carolina to bring his family, slaves, and livestock over land to the Tennessee River, sailed down that river, was attacked by Indians near Muscle Shoals, then proceeded down the Ohio, then the Mississippi to Natchez, arriving in 1774. Hutchinson, his wife, nine children, and a handful of slaves cut out a living near Natchez, fighting back against Native Americans and losing all they had at least once while trying to eke out a living. However, the landscape yielded great results when cotton, tobacco, and indigo was planted. Eventually, Hutchinson would own around a hundred slaves and a large swath of land. His story was a somewhat common story of determined settlers capitalizing on the growing cotton economy and utilizing the Mississippi River's ability to transport goods. In 1770, 500 whites lived near Natchez. By 1790, that number had grown to 2,000 whites and 1,000 blacks. Another war, the Revolutionary War, would alter the political landscape of Mississippi again. The British treaty with the Americans identified the southern border as the 31st parallel, which made Natchez American. The British treaty with the Spanish marked the boundary at the Yazoo River's entrance into the Mississippi, which included Natchez in Spain's holdings. Of course, Spain had won West Florida by conquest, and the fledgling American government would have been hard-pressed to force the Spanish out. So, from the end of the American Revolution to 1798, Natchez remained a border province with an uncertain future. The Spanish government made planters fortunes by agreeing to purchase two million pounds of tobacco at a subsidized price, even though the quality of the Mississippi product did not match that grown in the United States or the Caribbean. As a result, between 1787 and 1792, the slave population of Natchez tripled. Tobacco required intensive labor to sow the seeds, then to transplant the tiny plants into the field, to hoe around the plants, to top the plants in order to elicit the proper growth, to harvest, to cure, and finally to package the leaves for shipment. As they added slaves quickly, the planters turned to slaves fresh from Africa, made available by the Spanish, and found they preferred them to American-born slaves. By the early 1790s, two out of three Natchez slaves were African-born. Of course, the saltwater slaves added to the cultural mix of the area and eventually contributed to changes in the nature of slavery practices. Tobacco fell to the wayside and planters became concerned because they had purchased land and slaves on credit to take advantage of the tobacco market, but another crop would quickly take its place. Short staple cotton flourished in Mississippi and with the introduction of the cotton gin, it became the main export of the region. 
In 1795, the Treaty of San Lorenzo signified the transfer of Mississippi from Spain to the United States, but there was still a contest over the land. Local Spanish authorities didn't want to give up the land, even after the U.S. Congress approved it the next year. In February 1797, a trusted surveyor for George Washington who laid out the city of Washington, D.C., named Andrew Ellicott, was given the task of establishing a boundary with Natchez being within the U.S. boundary. A small military force from Chickasaw Bluffs, modern-day Memphis, came to support him and a standoff began with Spanish forces not wanting to relinquish governance over Natchez. After a few violent incidents, one involving a drunk Baptist preacher slash shoemaker railing against Catholicism, the Spanish were having trouble keeping order in the town. After this incident in June, the Spanish allowed for citizens to form a council to decide what to do next. Months went by with the Spanish and U.S. government authorities jockeying for political control until a large U.S. force occupied the town and convinced the Spanish to leave. In February 1799, the surveyors for the respective governments signed the official paperwork in New Orleans. The Mississippi Territory encompassed much of what is now the states of Mississippi and Alabama, and its economy was fast growing. In 1798, the Mississippi Territory exported 1.2 million pounds of cotton, 33 times more than what it exported four years earlier. President John Adams appointed Federalist and Harvard graduate Winthrop Sargent as territorial governor. Territorial legislation required the governor and two judges to constitute a quorum, so Sargent ruled by decree for most of his first year in office. When a second judge arrived, the three men adopted the territorial code cobbled together by Sargent. Punishments included the customary pillory and whipping post, with a state forfeiture for treason, arson, and burglary with violence. The code also required license fees to be paid to the governor for operating taverns and marrying. $8 for a tavern and $10 for a marriage. Given the lack of ministers available, frontier couples often failed to conduct a ceremony to seal their unions, and $10 seemed an exorbitant fee to most. Sargent sided with the more affluent members of the territory, and this drew the ire of the indebted planners and lower rungs of society. That group petitioned Congress to make the Mississippi Territory a second-grade territory giving them the ability to elect their own legislature. In 1800, the more numerous lower class and indebted planters won election to the legislature and began restricting the power of the governor. Sargent began a trip to Washington, D.C. to plead with the president to take away the territorial legislature, but on the way there, the new president, Thomas Jefferson, replaced him with W.C.C. Claiborne. Claiborne worked to sort out all the confusion over land titles, since the territory had been under the control of multiple countries. He ordered surveys of contested areas and helped ease the minds of landholders in the territory. However, he would leave in 1803 to help the Louisiana Purchase Acquisition. Before he left, he would set up the capital of the Mississippi Territory at Washington, a few miles outside of Natchez. The territory grew with the influx of white settlers and slaves imported from Africa and other states. David Holmes would become governor in 1809, and it would be under his governorship that the Mississippi Territory would see some of its greatest changes. The Mississippi Territory would officially get a coastline when Congress redrew the territorial boundaries. The War of 1812 would also help the white settlement of the territory. Andrew Jackson, after defeating the Red Sticks at Horseshoe Bend, would stab his Creek allies in the back by forcing them to sign over their rights to large swaths of land in what is now Mississippi and Alabama. With millions of acres now open to white settlement, the eastern portion of the territory, modern-day Alabama, grew rapidly. Before this moment, Easterners wanted Congress to split the territory in half so that the government at Natchez couldn't overpower the less populated East. The government at Natchez favored entering the Union as a single state so they could continue to dominate politics in the territory and the future state. However, when the East got flooded with settlers, the power dynamic shifted, and now the Easterners favored entering the Union as a single state while Natchez wanted to keep their political power and favored division. A delegation met at the Pearl River Convention in October 1816 to debate the issue. The single state supporters gained the upper hand and went to lobby Congress to support the single state policy. Despite the support at the Pearl River Convention for a single state policy, the Natchez constituents sent their own lobbyist to Congress, named William Lattimore, who was able to convince them to divide the territory. Now, representatives for the potential state of Mississippi met in Washington outside of Natchez at the Methodist Church to form a state government. Backwoods representatives fought unsuccessfully for more democracy in the shape of elected judges, voting privileges not dependent on property ownership, 
and an easy constitutional amendment process. Instead, they delivered the most conservative constitution of any state admitted after the War of 1812. Voters had to serve in the militia to sit in the state house of representatives. A man had to own real estate valued at $150. To serve in the state senate, he had to have 300 acres or have $1,000 interest in land. And to be governor required 600 acres freehold or $2,000 interest in land. The governor appointed the judges. The elite's suspicion of popular religion led them to forbid ministers serving either in the legislature or the governor's office. The writers of the Constitution gave the legislature the authority to forbid the importation of slaves as merchandise, although they assured an owner's right to bring his or her slave property into the state. The older brother of the future Confederate President Jefferson Davis and four other members proposed to punish cruel masters by confiscating an abused slave, selling him or her, and giving the proceeds of the sale to the poor instead of to the slave owner. Such a violation of property rights demonstrated strong emotions for a lawyer planter rising through society and making his fortune in the district. His proposal indicated that Davis's childhood experience of living closely with family slaves in a frontier setting left him with the understanding that slaves were human beings and must be treated as such. His minority view failed to win approval. Instead, the Constitution obliged the owners of slaves to treat them with humanity, to provide them necessary clothing and provision, to abstain from all injuries to them extending to life or limb, or in case of their neglect or refusal to comply with the directions of such laws, to have such slave or slave sold for the benefit of the owner or owners. After six weeks of summer debate, the delegates signed the Constitution on August 15th and declared the document valid without asking voters to approve their work. President Monroe accepted the Constitution and signed the resolution admitting Mississippi to the Union on December 10, 1817.